Okay, so um, first I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was at the workshop two years ago, um, and it's, it's great to be back. Um, I also want to say before I start that um, it's actually a particular honor for me to, to be giving a talk uh, in this conference because when I saw the schedule, I was really excited. The speaker after me is Giorgio Grada, and I actually, as an undergraduate, my first experience with physics research was as an undergraduate in Giorgio's lab. Um, and that's what got me into trying to do sort of AMO physics to study fundamental physics and new physics. Um, and I've sort of been doing that on some level with a break for most of my PhD since. So it's, it's really a pleasure for me uh, to give a talk in the same conference as Giorgio. So um, it's also nice because I get to follow up Andrew and he's given a nice introduction to uh, optical lattice clocks and to how they can be used to probe new physics. I'm also going to talk about that, but I'm going to focus a little bit on one particular kind of measurement that Andrew didn't really talk about, which is differential optical lattice clock comparisons. So in particular, uh, comparisons between two clocks where we do synchronized simultaneous comparisons and just look at differences between them. And I'll try to try to convince you why I think that's interesting and what some of the measurements, measurements we want to do along those lines are. So um, there we go. Okay, so uh, principles of an atomic clock, just really basic, I think uh, everyone in the audience already knows this, but you have your local oscillator, which for rubidium or cesium clocks is a microwave oscillator, um, a quartz tuning fork. And um, the issue is that it's drifting around uh, with respect to your definition of the second. So you reference it to, an, uh, to a transition in an atom. And in particular, this isn't working. No, okay, this, ah, okay. So you reference it to a transition in an atom. If you're on resonance, you can excite the atom from uh, G to E. If you're off resonance and you do the same experiment, then when you shine your radiation on your atom, nothing will happen. And so, of course, the, the trick is to sit on the edge of that transition and to feed back. And so if you do that in, say, some kind of Ramsey spectroscopy type um, experiment, then you end up with your atom in a superposition of G and E. When you measure at the end, you project it, and this is this kind of quantum coin flip of quantum projection noise that we heard a lot about this morning um, from Mark Kasevich and then also showed up in Andrew's talk. Um, and so from that, you can very easily write down um, an equation for what sort of the best performance of an atomic clock would be when you're limited by that quantum projection noise. Um, and this is kind of a nice recipe for how to make a good atomic clock. So it tells you everything that you kind of want in a good atomic clock. You want a narrow transition and cold confined atoms that you can probe for long times. You'd like many atoms and short dead times, um, and you'd like a high frequency transition. And of course, this motivates uh, moving from these rubidium and cesium microwave clocks to uh, optical clocks with optical transitions, which offers this boost by a factor of 10 to the 5 that Andrew already referenced. And so you go from a clock that looks like this to a clock that looks like this, where your local oscillator is a laser, and um, your frequency reference is now an optical transition, one of these group 2 atoms, and your counter is now a laser frequency comb. And so doing this, um, we've, there's been tremendous progress in the performance of clocks. Um, and this is kind of a combination of both the stability of the clock, which is the equation I showed before, and also the systematic uncertainty that I'm not going to talk a lot about. I'll sort of explain why later in my talk. But um, uh, as Andrew already referenced, we're now at this uh, performance level where these clocks are accurate to one second in the age of the universe, or 14 billion years. Maybe not the age of the universe, but at least accurate to one second in 14 billion years. And so, um, so this is really remarkable, and it's kind of reasonable to ask, well, wh what are they good for? And I think Andrew already explained some of the motivations. Um, you can kind of project forward this progress that clocks have made um, and uh, imagine some kind of Moore's Law type scaling for performance in clocks, and you can see that pretty soon we're going to be getting down into these numbers, 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 22, that are sort of suggestive of the um, sort of sensitivities you might need to see gravitational waves and things like that. Um, and uh, we're already crossing this geodetic limit that Andrew talked a lot about, which is our sort of ability to measure um, the height of these clocks with respect to the, um, to the Earth's geoid. Um, and so that opens a whole range of new uh, novel applications. This is kind of my own personal take on some of the interesting emerging applications of optical clocks. Um, you have sort of searches for new physics, um, which 
include some of the other things on here, but also geodesy, as we heard about from Andrew, potentially dark matter detection, tests of relativity, uh, gravitational wave detection, and also quantum simulation, which isn't really relevant to this, um, to this workshop, but is what I spent most of my uh, postdoc in June's group working on starting clocks on, but I won't talk about it today. So, um, you know, we were, while working with June uh, during my postdoc, we were trying to think about some of these applications, and in particular, how you might actually use uh, optical clocks to do gravitational wave detection, and so that's what I want to focus on first. So, of course, uh, it doesn't make any sense to talk about gravitational wave detection uh, without talking about LIGO. And in particular, I think one of the most exciting uh, sort of scientific events in my lifetime, at least, was LIGO's detection of this binary neutron star merger and the subsequent kilonova. Um, and one of the beautiful things about this was that uh, it was witnessed not only by uh, LIGO uh, and sort of somewhat by Virgo, but that's part of what allowed them to localize it, but also um, by sort of all of these other telescopes spanning the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which is really, truly amazing. And there's still tons of physics that we're learning about and being generated from this simultaneous observation of gravitational waves and electromagnetic signals. And this is sort of the, the now era of multi-messenger astronomy, uh, which is tremendously exciting. Um, you can see that the, the paper included a third of the world's astronomers, which is kind of truly remarkable. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, you'd like to be able to do this with the other events that LIGO and Virgo are um, are observing. Um, unfortunately, with these uh, binary black hole mergers, at least so far, they don't last long enough and have been difficult to localize such that at least when people try to point their telescopes in the same area, there's no electromagnetic signal that's been observed. Now, actually, LIGO has also observed what they think are binary neutron star black hole mergers which maybe also might have electromagnetic signals to them. And so far, at least, they've been unable to observe any signal in any optical um, or any electromagnetic telescopes. And so that partially motivates the construction of the next generation of gravitational wave detectors, which would be sort of LIGO in space, LISA and ELISA. Uh, these are much longer arm length uh, detectors that take advantage of this drag-free satellite-based um, sort of nodes in order to make a kind of Michelson interferometer in space. Um, and you can see here that they're targeting a different frequency range, uh, in part because you might be able to see some of these events very early on in the in spiral and then point telescopes at them. That LISA might be able to observe some of these events for uh, months or years before they reach into the LIGO band. Um, but also because there's a whole other range of potential sources of gravitational waves that you could see with LISA that you can't see with LIGO. Uh, and we sort of identified this region in between, motivated in part also by work by Mark Kasevich and his collaborators on uh, atomic interferometer-based gravitational wave detection, which is very related to clock-based uh, detection, as I'll tell you. Um, and so now um, there's some, as people start to think about this sort of mid-band or decihertz uh, band, people are identifying some interesting sources there as well, in addition to seeing a lot of the events that um, LIGO is now seeing weeks or months before they enter the LIGO band. Um, you'd all, could also expect to see some new kinds of candidate sources, such as uh, intermediate mass black hole binaries, stellar mass binaries uh, earlier on, and intermediate mass ratio in spirals, and maybe even, uh, depending on models, sort of stochastic gravitational wave background, depending on what sensitivities you reach. And so we were trying to think about, can you use uh, optical lattice clocks in space to build a kind of detector that can look in this frequency band? Um, so it turns out that if you look at where the existing limits in that range in the sort of mid-band or decihertz uh, gravitational wave, all of the previous limits on gravitational wave density are from Doppler tracking searches. Um, the idea, um, and David alluded to this deep space tracking network, is that you can actually um, use the Doppler shifts of the signals that spacecraft are sending back to you to see if there's relative motion of the spacecraft with respect to the Earth. And this is a little bit different than um, the interferometer-based uh, kind of detection in that it's a, a frequency detector instead of a phase detector. And that has a couple of consequences. First, the detector transfer function looks a little bit different. Um, that's what's being shown here. And what that means is that um, for a given arm length detector, you can see that as you go to higher frequencies, um, your sensitivity doesn't really drop off anymore. But you sacrifice in the, in the sense that you want to have a detector that's long enough to, um, to not sort of average out the signal and vice, sort of vice versa for a phase-based detector. Um, so that's one of the kind of main takeaways. And the other takeaway is that these detectors are typically not, or are not, uh, limited by photon shot noise, uh, like you are in an optical interferometer, but rather by the stability 
of the um, local oscillator that the spacecraft uses to generate the signal that it sends back in the first place. And so that naturally motivates using clocks, optical lattice clocks, for this instead, because they are very, very good clocks. They can be used to stabilize your local oscillator so that um, when you're detecting a frequency, the frequency of the thing you're trying to detect isn't drifting around all over the place. And so, um, con considering those kind of two considerations, we proposed a very long arm length, um, sort of more than an order of magnitude longer than LISA, style of detector where you have two sp uh, spacecraft, each with an optical lattice clock on board, and you're basically sending a laser. Uh, in principle, you only need to send it in one direction from one spacecraft to the other. And as a um, gravitational wave passes by, it moves these spacecrafts with respect to each other. It gives you a Doppler shift of that laser. And when you compare the laser in one spacecraft versus the other, you'll get a different detuning of that laser with respect to your atoms on board. And that's what you use to detect the gravitational wave. Um, and so that's a kind of, you can pretty simply write down what you expect the sensitivity of your detector to actually be. And it's, again, sort of a different version of the same equation that I already showed you. It's just the quantum projection noise of the, num the number of atoms you have on each spacecraft and um, sort of the line width of the atomic transition. So um, you can plug in numbers and see how good you have to do in order to be competitive. And it's quite ambitious. This is talking about uh, 7 times 10 to the 6 strontium atoms per clock, taking full advantage of the coherence possible sort of coherence time achievable with strontium of uh, about 160 seconds. Um, and um, you can get a sensitivity for this kind of con configuration that's comparable to LISA. Um, but you can see that actually it doesn't seem to be behaving like I sort of uh, said it would in the sense that it seems to be falling off at higher frequencies, um, even though we have this long arm length detector. And that's because instead of having a spatial sort of uh, averaging over the vari varying signal, you have a, now have a time average. If you're, if you're probing it with a um, Ramsey sequence, then if you're gravitational wave is oscillating quickly, it'll just average out, right? And you'll end up missing a lot of the signal. Um, you can compensate for that by just doing a shorter Ramsey interrogation and increase the sensitivity at a higher frequency. But now you're kind of suffering because you're um, getting adding in the projection noise of all of those shorter measurements without taking full advantage of the coherence of the strontium uh, transition, this really long lifetime of the transition. So what you can do instead is use one of these so-called dynamical decoupling sequences to basically lock in at a very specific frequency. And now you can achieve the same sensitivity that we had at lower frequencies at sort of arbitrary frequencies up here at higher frequencies, but only in a very, very narrow band. And so this is a kind of new gravitational wave detection modality in the sense that you have a narrow band detector that you can tune around without changing the spatial configuration of the uh, spacecraft or the detector at all. So we think this is kind of an appealing um, sort of different kind of detector modality that, and in principle, there's no reason why you couldn't, for example, put clocks on board uh, LISA and use both at the same time. And also then LISA benefits from the improved local oscillator laser stability that you get from having an optical clock on board. Um, I do want to recognize uh, some of the other proposals that are very related that came, have come out of the atom interferometry uh, community and, and, and in many respects uh, inspired our proposal. And also I want to point you to a nice article from James Thompson's group that tried to kind of make connections between these different proposals and explain sort of how some of the different techniques that are used in uh, atom interferometry might be applied to clocks and vice versa. And it's actually, there's a, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff still to be discussed there. Um, but at any rate, so um, we can look at this and this looks, uh, you know, pretty promising to us. And we can plot that here and just imagine that you could track, for example, one of these in spiral events with this narrow band detector just by changing the sequence you apply locally to each of these sets of atoms as it's occurring. Um, and now I'm, I'm sort of happy to say that the sort of uh, LISA and the gravitational wave community seems to be interested in this and, and, and kind of coming on board with some of these ideas. So um, myself and the session chair, who was also an author on this paper, um, are now members of the LISA consortium. Uh, and this is from a white paper that was written by the LISA consortium uh, discussing some of the prospects for next generation detectors in this mid-band decihertz uh, range. And you can see that they're now including um, some of these kind of proposals in their uh, kind of possible uh, detector sensitivities for next generation detectors, which is quite uh, exciting. Um, and you can actually see that here, uh, Igor and I decided not to include this capability to do dynamical decoupling, but you can imagine 
Uh, there's the atomic clock uh, curve there, and you can imagine adding in this dynamical decoupling sequence and sort of tracking some of these events, like these stellar binary black holes and intermediate ratio in spirals, as they go from the LISA band to the LIGO band. Um, so this sounds quite nice, but uh, if you look at kind of current clock performance, the very best comparisons between clocks today are about four orders of magnitude away from um, where we need them to be. You might be a little bit surprised because I started this whole thing by saying, well, clocks are now at 10 to the minus 18, but that is sort of uh, the absolute uh, precision or accuracy that you average down to. Here, this is the strain sensitivity in per square root hertz. So we actually need a stability at the 10 to the minus 20 per root hertz level. And that really is three to four orders of magnitude away from where we currently are with the best clocks. Uh, and that's on Earth. And now I'm talking about putting them in space. So this starts to sound uh, kind of totally uh, insane. But I think it's not nearly as bad as it sounds. And so um, the reason for that is partially that I showed you this equation and said this is sort of the limit for clocks. But it turns out that most of the time, clocks are not really operating at this quantum projection noise limit. Uh, in particular, um, you have what's called the Dick effect, which is a kind of unfortunate um, pernicious effect that occurs when you have dead time in your clock, where local oscillator noise at high frequency gets aliased down and starts to look like uh, low frequency noise. And as a result, um, clocks typically don't uh, operate at the quantum projection noise limit, at least uh, for more than you know, hundreds of atoms. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the, the sort of line widths of our, of our local oscillators, of our lasers, are much worse than the line widths of our atoms, so we're limited to much shorter uh, kind of uh, coherent interrogation times than we would like. Here, in this case, about three orders of magnitude less than the kind of natural line width of strontium, for example, in this example from the, uh, from the E group. And so there's actually a lot of room for improvement, and in particular, what you can do is do these kind of differential clock comparisons and this is um, a similar slide to one that was shown by Andrew, but he didn't discuss one of the other really nice results from the same paper, which was that if you synchronize the um, measurements of two clocks and use the same local oscillator to probe both of them, you can completely cancel out this local oscillator noise, and you can get an improvement in stability. And um, in principle, you can even push out uh, well beyond the coherence time of the local oscillator, because even though now you'll pick up a completely random phase each time, in principle, it should be the same random phase for both of your um, atomic ensembles. And this is uh, an analogy to, for example, some of the sort of gradiometry experiments that are done in the atom interferometry community. Um, and so you can use this to get really kind of much better uh, stabilities. Um, another really nice example was done in the E group in the um, 3D optical lattice clock, which is the new kind of latest uh, clock incarnation, um, optical clock incarnation. And here they actually compared different parts of the same 3D uh, atom lattice ensemble, and we're able to achieve uh, quite uh, impressive stabilities. So uh, here, 3.6 times 10 to the minus 17. Um, and I think there's reason that you can push this even much, much further. And the downside in this particular example is that here you're just comparing two parts of the same cloud of atoms, so it's hard to do much different between them. Um, so what I'm proposing to build, and what we're currently building at University of Wisconsin, is a multiplex strontium optical lattice clock where basically we'll have two uh, independent lattices in a single vacuum chamber, each with its own strontium ensemble, where we can do differential comparisons between them and cancel out both uh, laser frequency noise and also all of the systematics that people spend so much of their time, or at least most of the systematics that people spend most of their time in the clock community um, kind of characterizing and worrying about. So um, I'll quickly kind of say what I think the kind of pros and cons of this style of differential clock comparisons are. Um, and uh, starting, you know, since I'm sort of maybe naturally a pessimist, with the disadvantages. So, um, for one thing, the most important point is that it can't be used as frequency reference or time standard, right? Here we're really doing a differential comparison of the, the frequencies of these two atom ensembles and completely canceling out uh, the frequency of the laser, which is the thing that actually acts as the clock in an optical lattice clock. So this can no longer really be used as a clock. Um, Another disadvantage is that you can't really compare between different elements or clock transitions in the same element without a frequency comb, because you'd need two different lasers, and you'd, you'd need to kind of have the phase noise of those two lasers shared. And that's possible with a comb, but, um, but difficult, and not really possible without a comb. So we're stuck comparing sort of uh, two ensembles of the same uh, atom, uh, or at least the same element. 
Um, this is, in, for this, some of the same reasons, is not really sensitive to slow variations of fundamental constants. So you can't do some of the searches for new physics that you can do um, with, uh, you know, tr more traditional optical lattice clocks. Um, but now to the advantages. So first of all, as I said, this significantly relaxes the clock razor requirements and means that we don't need one of these, uh, you know, 10 millihertz line with uh, cryogenic single crystal cavity clock uh, lasers in order to, to make interesting measurements. It also relaxes our duty cycle requirements because we don't have to worry about the Dick effect anymore. Um, at, uh, at the same time, of course, you still want the best duty cycle possible just because it means you're uh, measuring for less time if you have a low duty cycle, but it doesn't enter your uh, measurement as noise. Um, you now benefit from more atoms because you can now really truly be quantum projection noise limited instead of being limited by the stick effect. And so we can start taking full advantage of the optical lattice clock design, which allows you to, in principle, have thousands or even, uh, you know, in principle, millions of atoms that you're comparing between. Um, it's immune to shared systematics. So uh, as long as our atoms are in the same environment, they'll get the same sort of shifts and perturbations from black body radiation, from magnetic and electric fields. And so now we'll be susceptible instead to things like magnetic field gradients, electric field gradients, and thermal gradients in our chamber that we'll have to characterize. But those should be at a much lower level than you would expect the absolute shifts uh, from all of those systematics to be. And uh, an advantage for me as an assistant professor building up my group is that it doesn't require a $500,000 laser frequency comb um, uh, to do it. You just need a single laser that you can use to compare these two atoms. Um, and finally, I think, you know, sort of appealingly, because we're no longer limited by the uh, laser line with or anything like that, it really enables lifetime limited coherent interrogation, at least in principle. So you can now take full advantage of the promise of these um, really beautiful optical clock transitions with 100 second lifetimes. Um, and so, okay, I can, it's easy for me to say that. In practice, what does that mean? Well, there's limits to actually achieving uh, lifetime limited coherent interrogation. The first is clock laser coherence, but as I said, we'll take advantage of these synchronized simultaneous differential comparisons to get around that. So we'll be making plots like this where we plot the kind of phase or population on one axis for one ensemble and the phase or population on the other axis for the other. And it will be a totally random phase, but it will be correlated between the two populations so we can get away from um, our clock laser coherence. There's background gas collisions that might limit the lifetime of your atoms. So I'm happy to say that we uh, are working very hard on building this apparatus and we've achieved um, some excellent vacuum. So in particular, this is actually limited by the precision of the gauge. It won't display below one times 10 to the minus 11, but uh, you can look at this current here, which has since fallen. Uh, this is the current on our ion pump. It's since fallen to six nanoamps, and you can try to convert that into a background gas, and it's something like two times 10 to the minus 12 um, tor. So we think we are in a regime where we won't be limited by background gas collisions at all. The next limitation is broadening due to um, strontium strontium collisions between uh, atoms on the same pancake in the lattice. Um, and this is an issue in optical lattice clocks. The 3D lattice clock uh, tackled this issue by increasing the strength of that interaction significantly on each individual site so that you can actually resolve them spectrally. We don't, for a number of reasons, we don't want to go to the complexity of a 3D lattice clock. So we're taking a different approach, which is to use photo association uh, in order to kind of kill multiply occupied sites. So the plan is to use photo association so that in the end, we end up getting rid of all pairs of atoms uh, till we're left with either one or zero atoms on each side of our lattice. Um, and this will take a while. This is kind of slow. Um, we're using a narrow line with transition to do it. Um, and it's, uh, but again, we're not as limited by duty cycle in this uh, modality of measurement. So we think that we can basically enter a regime where we don't have uh, any broadening or inhomogeneity due to strontium strontium uh, interactions anymore. Uh, and so what I think in the end probably is likely to limit us is, uh, and this is turning up in optical lattice clocks all around the world is Raman scattering from the uh, lattice laser. Um, so this is scattering out of one of the two clock states in strontium. It's the excited clock state due um, to two photon transitions. Um, but if you look at the numbers, we think we can use, say, weak vertical lattices with sort of um, an easily achieved, in principle, 100 second uh, interrogation times and lifetimes. And so uh, if you plug in the numbers being somewhat conservative, for five, only 500 atoms uh, and 10 second interrogation times, you can achieve um, a stability that's sort of an order of magnitude from what people are currently operating at. And so that plotted on this curve looks like a pretty big step in the direction of ultimately reaching these kind of um, higher levels of stability. And, it, and one of the things that we plan to do is actually to test uh, 
whether these kind of dynamical decoupling sequences really work, and we can play fun games like injecting gravitational wave signals differentially into our uh, two ensembles and, and use a sequence like this to measure it. So we do want to use this uh, platform as a way to kind of test this proposal uh, and, and push in this direction just on Earth first and then maybe eventually in space. Um, okay, another uh, application of this sort of uh, multiplex clock that I'm excited about is to do a combination of geodesy and tests of relativity. So um, Andrew already mentioned the gravitational redshift, so the um, shift you get between two clocks in a uh, gravitational potential when they're at a different height. Um, and of course, this is uh, starting to be used around the world to try to map out the um, Earth's geoid. Um, this is a nice example from um, the sort of standards institutes in Europe that are have actually put a strium clock in a trailer that can be towed around on a truck and have now measured at different nodes on an optical network um, and are starting to do geodesy that way. But I think another really nice example was done at NIST in Boulder where they uh, lifted a single ion clock with respect to another ion clock by one foot and were able to see the gravitational redshift. And I think this is just a really beautiful, uh, cool experiment. And now our um, optical lattice clock, like the ones in Andrews Labs, are capable of measuring not just at the uh, foot scale, but really at the cent uh, centimeter or maybe even sub-centimeter scale. So one of the things I'm excited to do is just raise one of these two sub-ensembles, one lattice with respect to the other, by a centimeter or millimeter and measure the gravitational redshift at the millimeter scale. Now, I don't think we expect to really see any new physics there. There's not any reason why you would, uh, would expect to, um, but it is kind of a nice demonstration of what these clocks are capable of. But what I'm really excited about is sort of turning that on its head to do a kind of new uh, test or realization of the um, sort of Einstein equivalence principle, sort of uh, elevator Gedanken experiment. And so the idea here is that, uh, you know, the way, one of the ways to formulate Einstein's equivalence principle is that you can't tell the difference between being in an elevator sitting on Earth and being in an elevator in space that's accelerating with an acceleration A equals G. Um, and so the gravitational redshift that you get from two clocks at a different height delta a, with a height difference delta H on Earth should be equivalent to the special relativistic time dilation effect that you get for these two clocks in this elevator in space. And that's kind of a maybe a counterintuitive thing, at least to me. It's not maybe immediately obvious where this um, uh, sort of effect actually comes from, um, but there's, there's different ways to think about it, and in the end, it, it, it should be there for special relativity as well. And this is an effect that hasn't been observed. And what's nice is that um, optical lattices are quite easy to accelerate. Um, optical lattices formed by uh, two counterpropagating laser beams, and if you shift the frequency of one of the two laser beams with respect to the other, the lattice will, will move. And so by ramping the frequency of one of the two laser beams, you can accelerate the lattice. People in cold atom experiments have generated uh, in excess of 100 G accelerations of at atoms in optical lattices. And so um, we plan to do this experiment by first measuring the gravitational redshift uh, in Earth's gravitational potential, and then putting these two lattices at the same height, so now gravity is going into the slide here, and accelerating them. Um, and uh, the prediction is that even if the two lattices are accelerated for the same amount of time with the same exact acceleration, they'll accumulate a clock shift that's proportional to their separation along the axis of acceleration and the, the, um, the rate that they're accelerated at. Now, the problem is that while it's easy to accelerate these lattices, you can't do it for very long before your atoms smash into the side of the vacuum chamber. Um, so we're going to use the same exact idea that I already talked about with gravitational wave detection, which is these dynamical decoupling sequences. So you can do a pulse sequence like this, where you um, ramp your lattice frequency up and down and apply pi pulses in between while you're keeping your lattice uh, frequency constant. Um, and now your atoms will kind of oscillate back and forth, but they'll never really go very far and they'll continue to constructively accumulate this clock shift due to these accelerations. And so I think this is going to be a really fun experiment, and we hope to be, sort of uh, see this special relativistic analog to the gravitational redshift for the first time. So you can ask now, okay, can we really test new physics with this kind of new uh, test? So there are pretty stringent limits on the Einstein equivalence principle, but they're a combination of a number of different measurements. So in particular, the Einstein equivalence principle can be formulated as a combination of the weak equivalence principle, local Lorentz invariance, and local position invariance. And so um, all of these together, kind of all of these different precision tests together, give you limits on the Einstein equivalence principle and give you the Einstein equivalence principle. And so while we certainly, because we're measuring effects uh, at sort of a single digit, we're kind of seeing these effects um, at the 10 to the minus 18 level, which is kind of the performance of our clocks, 
um, we're unlikely to reach these levels of precision to get to, say, four or five digits. Um, but I think it's kind of nice and interesting to realize them all in one experiment at the same time, to kind of directly realize this kind of Einstein's thought experiment. And also, in principle, it may test some kind of more out there exotic theories that each of these individual tests together uh, don't. And so that's something that I'm working on actually with, again, our session chair, um, Igor Pekovsky, on trying to understand if there are any interesting theoretical uh, implications to doing a test like this. Um, quickly, I want to touch on using uh, these uh, differential comparisons for dark matter detection. So, uh, you know, there's a number of different ways in principle that you can use um, optical atomic clocks to do dark matter detection, and Andrew already touched on a couple of them. So you can do atom cavity comparisons, or you can do um, multi-species comparisons, or you can do long distance clock comparisons where you rely on the time delay between the gravitational wave uh, or no, sorry, not in this case, dark matter passing through one clock and then the other clock and giving you a shift that's separated in time. Um, and that's, I'd say, the one that we can get closest to kind of realizing in our um, differential multiplex clock measurements. So I'm um, working with a colleague of mine at University of Wisconsin, Yang Bai, on seeing whether for a 10 centimeter separation between optical lattice clocks, there are any interesting dark matter uh, sort of candidates that we can rule out. Yang uh, has been proposing some of these um, foggy sort of dark matter candidates, uh, something called cue balls and sort of uh, related sort of sort of circles or spheres of dark matter um, that are uh, non-topological solitons. Um, and at least in principle, it looks like we can put maybe some, some interesting limits on, on this particular candidate with um, this, this is for a month of measurement using the same stability that I already showed you for two clocks separated by 10, or these two sub-ensembles separated by 10 centimeters. And in principle, you could do much better by separating these clocks further. So it might be interesting to actually even look at whether um, your Bacon measurements already put sort of stringent limits on these kind of candidates. Um, and uh, quickly, I want to mention also uh, ways to still use these differential comparisons to search for new physics. While we can't look for slow variations of fundamental constants, uh, one thing that we can do is isotope shift measurements. And I think this, uh, this particular configuration is a really nice way to do isotope shift measurements. So what we're proposing is loading uh, one lattice with strontium-86, say, uh, as an example, and one lattice with strontium-88, and then uh, simultaneously probing them and using an AOM to, to add the frequency offset to account for the isotope shift. And then we can still get this kind of nice synchronized uh, cancellation of all of the clock laser noise and uh, very precisely measure the isotope shift uh, uh, on the clock transition for strontium. And so this has been proposed as a way to potentially probe for the existence of new bosons that couple to either the electron or uh, the neutron. Um, and the way you would do that is by measuring at least four isotopes and uh, at least two different clock transitions in the same atom, uh, and then making this kind of king plot ratio um, uh, plot for the isotope shifts for those two different transitions for four different isotopes, and then a nonlinearity in this King, King plot may be a signature of new physics. Um, but I should uh, mention that, of course, you can also have known physics that gives you nonlinearities. And in a, in a couple slides, I'll show you that uh, Gretchen Campbell has also been pursuing these measurements and recently saw some of these nonlinearities and measurements where you wouldn't expect to see any new physics. So um, it's, it, there's, there's more work that needs to be done to show whether this is really a viable way to probe for new physics, but it's still interesting. And so we are building our apparatus to be able to do this. In particular, we're designing all of our laser systems so that we can rapidly shift frequencies to cover the isotope shifts so that we can cool first one into one lattice, move that lattice away, and then cool into the other lattice um, and do these isotope shift comparisons in this synchronized fashion. Um, and we've already achieved that for our 461 nanometer um, laser system. So we can, we can shift all sort of 100 milliwatts of our cooling light around while remaining locked to um, a strontium reference cell. Uh, and here are the measurements I referenced. So uh, Gretchen Campbell has already measured the isotope shift ratios between um, the 689 nanometer transition in strontium, which is from 1s0 to 3p1, and the 698 nanometer clock transition. And she already sees rather large nonlinearities that are likely due to the hyperfine um, structure of strontium 87. So one option would be potentially to also make these measurements with strontium 90, 
Uh, unfortunately, that's a sort of a radioactive element of strontium, um, and so we're not planning on doing that anytime soon, but it's something that we could consider doing in the future to get away from these nonlinearities. Uh, finally, a couple of other kind of promising directions, I think. You can also use these differential synchronized comparisons to maybe characterize some limiting clock systematics. Here's an example of using it to look at the lattice AC Stark shift and combining it again with these dynamical decoupling sequences, um, and then I also think it's a promising platform to explore quantum enhanced clocks. We heard a lot about this this morning from, from Mark, uh, um, and I'm interested in doing that by introducing Rydberg interactions. So I'm um, collaborating with Mark Safman at the University of Wisconsin to try to introduce Rydberg interactions into our lattice and generate these one-axis twisting Hamiltonians uh, in order to maybe uh, then generate spin squeeze states. And I think this is a really nice platform for doing that because, again, all of the things that would normally give you decoherence of these ra rather fragile uh, sort of spin squeeze states, um, such as local oscillator noise, environmental perturbations, and everything, it's all shared between the two ensembles. So these differential comparisons are maybe a really nice platform to first realize some benefit from spin squeezing. Um, and then in addition, it's appealing because Rydberg states can also be used for um, black, or have been proposed to also be used for black body radiation thermometry. Uh, and electric field measurements in order to characterize some systematics. So there's other reasons why it might be nice to introduce Rydberg, inter um, Rydberg states into these uh, optical lattice clocks. Okay, so um, I, I've talked a lot about things that I would like to do, so I want to get it, give you a sense of where we are in terms of doing it. This is what my lab space looked like in June 2018. Um, it was at the time uh, a theory sort of bullpen for a number of theorists. Uh, this, was, this picture was taken right before we kicked all the theorists out. And um, now this is what it looked like in February of 2019. So this is right when we first moved in. Um, and this is now what it looked like in July of 2019. So it's now a real uh, AMO lab, and we have our vacuum chamber pumped down and everything. And um, I was hoping, really hoping, to have a picture of Amat to show you. Um, we're not there yet, but I really think it could be almost any day now. Um, and so it's, a, it's kind of a very exciting time for us. Um, and I want to, uh, and I think I'd say we're about maybe still a year or so away from really starting to make some of these differential, uh, differential clock comparisons. But um, Amat will be a really nice first uh, milestone. And so I want to recognize the people who've been working on this and uh, the funding that I've been getting to do it. Um, so in particular, I want to um, recognize uh, collaborators Igor Pakovsky, Mark Safman, and Yang Bai. Um, and my group members, and in particular the ones working on the strontium experiment, are postdoc Shin Seng, who's been fantastic. Uh, grad student Megan Tabit and Brett Merriman, who's actually an undergrad but is really working at the level of a grad student at this point, which has uh, been uh, really amazing. And I'll stop there and uh, thank you all for your attention and take any questions you have. Yeah. First, I'd like to thank all the clock speakers. It's been a fantastic session. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. If you use Goodberg states, they're highly polarizable. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. Okay. So the, the idea is not to use the Rydberg states f as the clocks themselves, but merely as a mechanism to I initially introduce the spin squeezing. Um, so, to, so to go back, the idea is that, um, and in fact, it's, uh, uh, it's an important point that these Rydberg states aren't even trapped in the, uh, in the magic wavelength lattice. Not only is it not a magic wavelength lattice, uh, they're likely anti-trapped. Um, so we can't really have, at least in the current configuration, uh, generate these Rydberg states and have them stick around, but we can use them, we can just dress them off resonantly, so you can see this uh, delta there. Um, and so what we can do is we can dress one of the two clock states with, that, um, with a little bit of this Rydberg state to introduce much stronger interactions between uh, the atoms on neighboring sites. And that generates the, a Hamiltonian that looks like this, um, this one-axis one axis twisting SC squared Hamiltonian that allows you to then make um, sort of these spin squeeze states. And only then, once you've done all of that, do you actually start to do your clock interrogation. And at that point, you don't do anything with the Rydberg states anymore. Um, so in principle, you're really only, you, you, you turn this dressing off at that point, there's no more Rydberg state there. Um, and so it doesn't really affect the actual clock interrogation at all. It's just to generate um, a state with reduced uncertainty in one quadrature. Yeah. So you mentioned you have this acceleration idea, like a just testing equivalent principle. Uh -huh. so, but you have to decelerate when you do the measurement. Ah, well, that's one of the nice things about this uh, sort of uh, particular scheme that, that we're proposing. So 
uh, if you look at the sequence, so deceleration is nothing but acceleration in the other direction. Um, and so what that means is that you can't do it without canceling out uh, the signal. In some sense, if I have my two clocks separated and they're accelerating in one direction, if I decelerate, it kind of completely cancels. But if you, if you stop accelerating, which is not decelerating, it's just now moving at a constant velocity, and apply a pi pulse, and then accelerate in the other direction, my atoms decelerate and then start to move in the other direction. And actually, the beautiful thing is that these dynamical decoupling sequences like CPMG, which are kind of the ideal sequences to undo pulse errors and things like that, actually mean that you first accelerate for half a period of time, then you accelerate for twice that period of time, and then half that period of time again, you end up exactly where you started and at rest again. And so at least in principle, <laughs> you can do this without uh, ever moving too far, and then you can stack as many of these sequences as you want to just keep wiggling your atoms back and forth. Um, now, you are getting systematic effects like your lattice frequency is shifting, so you're moving away from the magic wavelength. But as you can see here, you actually don't need to go very far, only about a megahertz, which is not a huge detuning. Uh, and it's common mode for your two atoms. As long as your lattices are the same, that shift should also be the same. So at least in principle, I think this should work. But I mean, uh, yeah. I have two questions. Yep. Yeah. And then, of course, this is also a twins experiment. Uh, well, I think actually one thing you could do is you don't even need to run it as an atom interferometer. I, I think you could also run this as a twins experiment. Uh, sure. But, you know, but yeah. The twins start together, so you need a, a, a reference path. Well, but I, what I would say is you could start with two clocks, um, you know, at rest, yeah. uh, accelerate one away, bring it back, and then compare them. So, uh, yeah. That part of the question. I yeah. Oh, right. Okay. So, um, so in, in principle, so this is for 10G and, and this particular sequence. Uh, 10 to the 17, we really don't need many reps at all, you know. You, well, I mean, I, you know, so if you, if you believe me that my stability is 1 times 10 to the minus 18 uh, per root hertz, then you need less than one second. Now, that's, of course, not true for reasons like Andrew alluded to. There's sort of a, like attack time of the servo that you use, you know, and all of those kind of things. But I think this is a signal that, you know, in principle, we can observe. Um, most of our time will be spent kind of making this work and characterizing systematics and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, two, oh, 100 clocks instead of two clocks. Yeah. Yes. Right. So I think specifically for this kind of differential modality that I'm talking about, it's not clear to me that there's a huge advantage to going to more. But there are a lot of other schemes you can imagine, like the one Andrew referenced, where you use one clock to actually sort of feed back on your local oscillator uh, and then probe the other clock with your now balanced local oscillator. You can imagine doing a bunch of sort of interrogations of a bunch of different sub-ensembles for different amounts of time to keep track of all the different phase slips of your local oscillator so you can keep pushing further and further out. And there have been proposals to kind of do this. And I think this is, in some sense, the direction that these tweezer clocks, which have just emerged in the last few months <laughs> um, as a kind of viable platform, are headed in, um, in the sense that you now have, say, an array of 100 single neutral atoms that you can independently, at least in principle, interrogate. Um, and you can interrogate for the, them for different amounts of time and things like that. Now. I don't know if you can read them out completely independently and all of those kind of things that sort of, but I think there are advantages to doing that. And of course, to running multiple clocks, you know, in parallel, so, yeah. Oh, so. Yeah, okay, yeah. I have two quick questions. Yeah. So just on the dy dynamic decoupling that yeah. was part of the gravitational wave, mm -hmm. so th does that presuppose having some other, uh, some other observatory uh, kind of tell you that that there's something to look for at mm. this frequency and go ahead and tune in there? Or can you, you know, can, can, it, can you scan the search space quickly enough mm. um, that, that you could actually do some kind of, you know, <coughs> algorithm for hunting for... Yeah, like, that's kind of all of those kind of signal processing and searching questions we haven't really considered. I mean, I think, it, you know, you can certainly imagine sitting at some particular 
frequency until something enters that band and then tracking it, for example, or maybe looking for something that someone's already told you to look for, looking for some particular candidate that you're most interested in. But I, in terms of how long it would take you to search for sort of this entire space, kind of like the haystack problem for axions or something, we, we haven't really thought about it. And I think it's a really direct, sort of interesting direction. I think, you know, this kind of detector, I mean, it's sort of more like, I guess, the Weber bar style of detector or something like that, but it hasn't really been a viable gravitational wave you know, sort of detection uh, platform before. So I don't think people have thought that much about it, or at least we haven't. Right. And uh, last question. So on the, uh, the differential lattices, do you uh, have a strategy? Or what's your strategy for uh, maintaining the relative phase registration between the upper lattice and the lower lattice? Right. So, um, so I have a couple different ideas. So actually, I, I sort of swept this under the rug for this talk, but my, my plan initially is to actually have both ensembles in a single lattice um, and just have the capability to kind of move the lattice around along the axis of the lattice. And so then you're still probing with one clock laser beam and the phase should be sort of perfect on these length scales. Um, and so then for these redshift measurements and these acceleration measurements, that's sufficient actually. So the idea would be load into one part of the lattice, shift the lattice over and then load into a second region of, this, of the same lattice and then just do comparisons between those two sub-ensembles. So all you need now is the Raleigh range of your lattice to be large enough so that it's tightly confined in those in that two regions. Well, but, well, uh, gooey phase shift of your clock laser, you're saying? Or, or, the, or the, also the lattice laser. That's a well, the, yeah, the lattice laser, I don't think the phase shift matters too much. It's just the frequency that gives you this magic wavelength condition. I, I'd have to think about it a little bit, but I can't, I don't think that the phase of the laser That's true. That is true. That is true, actually, yeah. But um, uh, the clock laser, I guess, does have a, a GUI phase shift. But again, it's, I think, kind of a constant offset. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I oh, think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up at this side. There's also a photo that's going to be taken now, uh, just before the coffee break, uh, just outside on the stairs outside the building. And uh, yeah, Shimon, thank you very much. Thanks.